Thank you. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, Hugh Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to consult on its proposal for the future of the British Transport Police. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, officer, the Scottish Government has been consistent in its view to integrate the British Transport Police in Scotland with Police Scotland. This has uh, been a view made public since before police reform. My predecessor wrote to the UK Minister for Transport in 2011 and again submitting a business case for integration in December 2013. The Scottish Government will continue to engage with all key stakeholders, including the British Transport Police, the British Transport Police Authority and the BTP Federation, the rail industry and RMT and Police Scotland to ensure our railways continue to enjoy excellent policing. This engagement will continue throughout 2015 as we work closely with stakeholders on proposals to shape the integration of the function of BTP in Scotland with Police Scotland. The good work of BTP officers and staff in Scotland is valued by the Scottish Government and the people of Scotland. Protecting and maintaining their specialist skills and knowledge will be a priority. Hugh Henry. Thank you, President Officer. I may be mistaken, but I think the Cabinet Secretary missed out his willingness to talk to ASLEF, which has also made a comment, and I hope that they would be included. President Officer, the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government are actually trying to pull a fast one here. Um, when there was an agreement in the Smith Commission to devolve the powers of the British Transport Police to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament, there was no mention in that agreement to the complete abolition of the British Transport Police. Now, the, the Cabinet Secretary may say that the Government is consistent in its views, but that doesn't mean that it absolves it of the need to properly consult. So will he, at this stage, again take the opportunity to put on record the, the willingness to actually consult meaningfully with all those involved before any final decision on structures are taken? Cabinet Secretary. Um, with regards to uh, the member's first point, can I say I'm more than happy to engage with ASLEF as well or any other stakeholders um, who have an interest in this particular issue. I must say, though, I do find the member's uh, position in this matter rather bizarre in that, uh, as a government, we set out our position regarding the integration of BTP in Scotland with Police Scotland back in 2011, and we've been consistent in that position. Uh, in fact, it was also within our white paper last year um, as, the, as the Scottish Government's preferred policy in this particular issue. And we've engaged with stakeholders over that period of time around that matter, not just from uh, the justice portfolio, but also from the transport uh, portfolio as well within uh, the Scottish Government. And the, all parties, it should also be recognised, is that all parties agreed to the recommendations within the Smith Commission, including the devolving of the functions of policing of Scotland's railways, which is presently carried out by the British Transport Police. What we are doing is we are saying that we wish to do that within the policing framework which we have within Scotland to create the appropriate accountability and line of authority in dealing with that matter. And we are going to consult with stakeholders on how that will be achieved so that stakeholders over the course of the year will be fully engaged in that process, an opportunity to make their views known on how they believe that could be taken forward and how that can best be achieved by making sure that we both maintain and we protect the very specialist function that British Transport Police officers have. And that's what we will do over the coming months and for the rest of this year before we come to a final decision on what that will be like, what the system will be like within the Police Scotland framework we have in Scotland. Mr Henry. Thank you, President Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary said that no one should be surprised because uh, the proposals were actually included in the, the government's white paper. As I recall, that was a white paper that was actually rejected by the majority of people in Scotland. So um, it, it can't use that as a justification. However, um, I hope that what I heard there was a willingness from the Scottish Government to actually consult um, and hopefully he will confirm that. But to properly consult on structures, on powers, on cross-border legislation, on funding, and to retain the very discrete identity 
of the British Transport Police within Police Scotland because no one in the Labour Party is disagreeing with the transferring and devolving of uh, powers to uh, hold the British Transport Police uh, responsible to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. That's not the issue. It's how we do it and it's how the functions and the skills and the, the expertise of the British Transport Police are protected and how critically funding and legal uh, legislative issues on cross-border jurisdiction is addressed. So can the Cabinet Secretary confirm today that all those issues will be fully consulted on and addressed before any final decision is taken? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm sure if the member recognises it was within our white paper, he clearly must have been aware of our policy position in this particular matter. Uh, but can I also say that, you know, the, his party signed up to the Smith Commission. They accepted the recommendation that the policing of our railways in Scotland should be devolved to the Scottish Government. What we are now doing is taking forward that policy within the Police Scotland framework that we now have with a single national force operating in Scotland. And what I said to the member in my first answer, if he had listened to, is that we will engage with stakeholders, consult with them on how that should be taken forward within Police Scotland so that we both protect and maintain the specialist function that presently is carried out by British Transport Police Officers. You know, it's in my interest and the Scottish Government's interest and in everyone's interest to make sure that our railways are effectively policed in Scotland. And that's why we're going to consult with stakeholders on how that can be achieved within the policing framework that we have in Scotland over the course of the year. Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise to what extent in any consultation value for money in relation to the running of a transport police service will feature? Cabinet Secretary. Well, resourcing will obviously be an important part of uh, the consideration how we move forward in this. But it's worth keeping in mind that the way in which uh, British Transport Policing is funded at the present time in Scotland is through Network Rail and also through the main uh, train operator, uh, ScotRail, uh, and which through various uh, means effectively is subsidised by uh, the Scottish Government, who largely pay for British Transport Policing in Scotland. Uh, it may be helpful for the member to be aware that in 2013-14, the actual cost met by Network Rail in Scotland and also for ScotRail was around £19 million. The British Transport Police budget for Scotland was £12.5 million. That figure excludes the cost of functions which are centralised to the British Transport Police uh, Authority. But as a government, we are keen to work with the rail industry, as my uh, colleague Derek Mackay is, uh, and with myself, uh, to make sure that we have a clear understanding of the funding mechanisms and the arrangements which will be put in place as we move forward within the overall policing structure we have now in Scotland. Margaret Mitchell. Presiding officer, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what discussions or consultation, if any, there was with Network Rail and the train operator, operators such as Virgin Trains and Stagecourt prior to the announcement of um, the proposal to integrate? And can he give any guarantees that the British Transport Police will not be deployed to general policing duties under the new proposals? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'll go back to my original answer, that is that we set out our position in 2011 about what our position was in British Transport Policing in Scotland, and it should be integrated as part of, at that time, uh, pre the police reforms that were taking place in Scotland. And we also put a business case to our colleague in the UK government back in 2013, stating why it should be part of uh, Police Scotland. So we've already engaged with stakeholders over the course of several years around this matter, uh, and it's been no secret about the approach that we wanted to take here uh, in Scotland. And now that it's been agreed and the clauses which have been put forward by the UK government, of which uh, our, our own party is a member, set out how that function is going to be devolved to uh, the Scottish government and to the Scottish Parliament. What we're now going to do is engage in looking at how that can best be achieved within the policing structure that we have within uh, Scotland. And all of those stakeholders, whether they be rail operators, whether they be unions, whether they be other uh, specialist interests who have an interest in that matter, will have an opportunity to engage with us and to consult with us on how that can best be achieved in order to make sure that I say we achieve the two things that are extremely important here, both maintaining and protecting the specialist function 
there are uh, our British Transport Police officers presently provide in Scotland. Alice McInnes. Much, uh, the Cabinet Secretary is right to say it's long been his government's view, although some of us might think he arrived at that view without sufficient dialogue with the British Transport Police and the unions. Um, in his defence, the Cabinet Secretary has said it's four years um, of, of discussion about this um, since you took the decision in 2011. Can you then give some detail, perhaps, of the discussion, how often you've met stakeholders, what concerns were raised and how you've addressed those concerns in that time? Well, it's worth keeping in mind that there were a range of organisations who opposed the idea that it should actually be devolved in the first place. So there was a number of the organisations were not satisfied with the recommendations that had been reached, to, reached by the Smith Commission itself, which her own party and all the other parties actually uh, signed up to. So I recognise that there is some long-standing uh, objection to the idea that these should become a devolved uh, functions. And over uh, the years, my predecessor has engaged with a number of those stakeholders around these matters, between the rail operators and also uh, uh, with uh, a number of the uh, other interested parties. And I know my officials have been engaged with the uh, British Transport Police uh, in London and also with the British Transport Police Authority and also with the British Transport Police Federation have been in dialogue with them uh, in uh, recent months. And what I can assure the member of is that, as has always been the case, we were going to engage with stakeholders on how we can best achieve that move forward to integration in Scotland in a way that allows us to protect and maintain those specialist functions. So if the member is keen to be assured about our commitment to making sure that engagement is going to be undertaken, she can have that assurance here today that I will ensure that those stakeholders who have a view on how that should be shaped within the policing structure that we now have in Scotland will have an opportunity to do that over the coming weeks and months ahead. Question number two, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it is tackling severe and extreme poverty in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary, Alex. The Presiding Officer, yesterday we published the report Severe Poverty in Scotland, which showed that in 2012 13, 510,000 people were classed as living in households in severe or extreme poverty. This figure is a disgrace, but it's an unfortunate, inevitable result of the UK government's failed austerity agenda and welfare cuts that are slashing incomes for some of our poorest households. With employment increasing and unemployment down, Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK, yet the statistics show that a job is no longer any guarantee against severe or extreme poverty. That's why we oppose cutting in-work tax credits and why the Scottish Government and its agencies are paying the living wage and encouraging other employers to follow suit. We have put tackling poverty and inequality at the heart of government through policies like the council tax freeze, free prescriptions and expanding childcare provision. Further, we are mitigating the worst of the welfare cuts by replacing income loss through the bedroom tax or council tax benefit cuts. That action is making a real difference and we'll continue to make the argument for a fairer welfare system. Claire Adamson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Last week, the Welfare Reform Committee heard from Professor Fothergill of Sheffield Hallam University, who told members that in-work households can expect to lose around £730 million a, re a year as a result of welfare cuts. How have these shocking figures in poverty been influenced by cuts to benefits for those who are in work? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, there is no doubt that welfare reform has impacted on the incomes of the poorest households in Scotland. Poorer households in work have over recent years relied on tax credits and other benefits to boost their incomes. However, as the Severe Poverty Report has pointed out, Changes to benefits and tax credits in 2012-13 served to reduce household incomes for some poorer households in work, including families with children. It is also worth noting that additional welfare reform changes introduced more recently have not been factored into this report or as yet into Scotland's annual poverty statistics. Ms. Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I concur with the Cabinet Secretary, indeed, that the UK Government's decision to freeze work allowances will cut the incomes of those who are in work and working hard to get out of poverty. Will he join in me in calling on the Chancellor to significantly increase work allowance in this week's budget? Cabinet Secretary. 
Presiding Officer, we certainly will, as the First Minister outlined in a speech in London yesterday. The analysis published by the Scottish Government on Monday showed that more than half of all children and more than 40% of working age adults in severe poverty in Scotland live in households where at least one person is in work. But the current UK Government's policy of freezing work allowances effectively cuts the benefits of workers on low incomes. And that's why the First Minister called on the UK Government yesterday to announce a significant increase in the work allowance in the budget tomorrow. Increasing the work allowance would help secure that those in work but in low incomes have a better chance of lifting themselves and their families out of poverty and it would substantially boost the welfare to work incentive uh, that would be available. Neil Bibby. Um, will the Cabinet Secretary uh, join, me, join with me in congratulating Renfrewshire Council on the publication of their Taft Killing Poverty Commission report? And can I ask uh, the Minister following the publication of the report specifically what the Scottish Government will do to help Renfrewshire Council lift children out of poverty in Renfrewshire? Presiding officer, Renfrewshire is one of those areas, like many other parts of the West and Central Scotland, where there is a great deal of uh, poverty amongst children, and we will work with Renfrewshire Council and indeed every council, both in urban and in rural areas, to tackle child poverty. But the best thing we can do to do that is actually to make sure that we get a government uh, that is prepared to adopt the kind of policies on tax and benefits that would benefit poor, poorer people. And the best way to get that is to transfer, transfer responsibility for tax and benefits to this parliament, because irrespective of which party forms the government in London, Labour or Tory, there is no doubt the Tory policies will continue. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We are now moving on to the next out of business, but I'll give a few moments for the front bench to sort out the seating arrangements.